Welcome to Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. In 1997, Jonathan Mayberg received a Thomas J. Watson Fellowship to travel to remote communities around the world, a year-long journey that sparked his enduring fascination with islands, birds, and the deep history of the living world. Since then, Jonathan has written reviews, features, and interviews for a number of print and online publications. But he's best known as the leader of the band, Shearwater. Today, Jonathan is here to talk about a bird that has fascinated everyone from Darwin to Mann to Hudson to Jonathan himself. Welcome, Jonathan, and thank you for being part of the Bird Podcast. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. So what are caracaras? Yes, caracaras are a group of the falcon family that live mostly in South America. And uh, South America has no crows, or <clears throat> it has a, f- a few jays in the tropics, but they have no big black crows like we're accustomed to seeing in the rest of the world. And it's almost as if they have these instead. It's, uh, I tell people that it's if you imagine uh, 10 separate attempts to build a, a crow on a falcon chassis, uh, then you might end up with birds like this. They're birds of prey, uh, but they're also uh, scavengers, they're omnivores, they're opportunists, they're social, uh, and they're very, very intelligent. And they've, uh, but they've been somewhat neglected uh, in the literature and in, in most people's minds, I think, for a long time. It's strange. There's a, there's a, it's almost as if there's kind of some force field around them that repels people. And I think part of it is that people who are usually interested in birds of prey eagles, hawks, falcons, owls, uh, don't know what to do with caracaras. They, they don't quite fit the regular mold or, or what you would expect a bird of prey to be. And for people who are really snobbish about it, they, they don't, you know, one, one researcher told me, she was laughing when she said this, she said, people think they're bad falcons. They're, they're <laughs> dirty birds, you know. <laughs> they don't act properly. And even, even and Darwin... you chose them. Yeah. Oh yes, well they chose me. Actually, is what happened. I mean, they uh, I I met them. You mentioned this traveling fellowship, which I received after college. Uh, the Thomas J. Watson Foundation funds about sixty students in the U.S. every year to uh, pursue projects that they design themselves. And all you're expected to do is be out for the year, uh, go to uh, places that you've never been to before, and do this all by yourself. And so my project that the 21-year-old version of me pitched was going to places that were as, about as far as I could imagine from the southeastern United States where I grew up. And one of the first places I went was Tierra del Fuego, which is the southern tip of South America, only 500 miles from in the Antarctic Peninsula. And I realized that from there, you could get to the Falklands relatively easily. It's, I mean, it's never easy to get to the Falklands, but that's it's easier from there than almost anywhere else. And so I went uh, from Argentina over to Chile and then took a flight to the Falklands. Because I thought that this was going to be a really interesting human cultural experience, because the Falklands are uh, just off the, uh, to the east of the southern tip of South America. And they're, uh, they're a series of about 800, a set of 800 islands. Uh, I hadn't realized there were so many of them. But the, <laughs> I thought there might be one or two. But uh, there are two main islands that a very small human population of about 3,000 people live on. Um, and then there's this sort of necklace or garland of uh, small islands that are scattered around them, that some of which are very, very tiny. I mean, you could, you could walk around them in about five or 10 minutes. But this, uh, this constellation of these little islands has preserved a version of the, the ecology and wildlife that lived there before people came to the islands. And th- the Falklands are unusual in that they're probably the only place in the entire New World that Europeans actually discovered. So, uh, the the wildlife there is extraordinary, and it's a place that you can uh, you can sense for a moment what it would be like to be the very first person to go to a place and meet the animals there. Mm-hmm. This is something that uh, I didn't know about when I went there, but I <clears throat> I soon learned it, and it was something that had astonished Darwin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. It was something that had astonished Darwin when he appeared there in 1833. He was uh, a, a young person about the same age I was, and he was astounded by the tameness of the island's wildlife. 
uh, birds like snipe that he was, you know, or almost a legendary bird. You just don't see them. They're they're far away. They're cryptic. They're hidden. And when they see you coming, they're gone. In the Falklands, you can walk right up to them. They just look at you. The same with animals like uh, birds, like penguins and albatrosses, and they just look at you as if uh, they have no idea what you are or what to do with you or aren't sure if you're important or if you're a threat or anything. But the bird that struck him the most in the Falklands were uh, these birds called striated caracaras. And I met them and had the same reaction Darwin did to them, which was, what is this and what is it doing here? Because striated caracaras look sort of something like a cross between a, a hawk and a crow. They're, they're kind of dark birds, but it's as if someone was trying to build a raven out of a bird of prey. They... Uh, they like to run around on the ground. They have strong, powerful legs. And uh, if you visit the islands where they live, they'll come right up to you and start trying to take things out of your bag. And they, wow. <laughs> or, they'll, or they'll fly just above your head and, and, uh, and tap you on the top of your head as if they're trying to play tag with you, which is, it's very unnerving uh, at first because you think, aren't wild animals supposed to run away? But they, uh, they don't see any reason to fear you. And so they treat you like an equal, which is a, a sort of an astounding experience, especially when you think about the fact that this is how animals on Earth all were until not very long ago. You know, when yeah. people first crossed over the Bering Strait into to North America about 15,000 years ago uh, and walked from there all through South America, this would have been their experience every step of the way. Why were the Caracaras attractive to you as subject matter? Was it because they didn't behave like an endangered species, like you describe in the book? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, they, the, the first ones that I met just kind of stared at me. And uh, it, with this, this way, as if I owed them an explanation of some kind or something. I, I, just, I wasn't interested in birds particularly when I met them. Um, <laughs> I'd gone to this one island just because there were penguins there, and I thought I shouldn't pass up the chance to see penguins. But... Uh, I had never heard of anything like this. I didn't know what they were, and it was just such an astonishing encounter. Uh, and then when I went from that small island back to Stanley, the one main town in the Falklands, I met an ornithologist there named Robin Woods, who would cheerfully admit that he has one of the most unlikely uh, un names for an ornithologist you could imagine, <laughs> or likely. Uh, yeah, and he, uh, uh, he was about to lead the very first survey of the breeding pairs of these birds in the outer islands of the Falklands. And so I pestered him uh, until he took me along as an assistant on this trip, which was about six or seven weeks in the outer islands. And that introduced me to this world of the, you know, all of the, the, the breeding seabirds, the petrels, the albatrosses, the uh, endemic land birds. It, that was my real kind of baptism into the, into the bird world. And I think it would have affected anyone in that way. I don't think I'm particularly special. It's just such an extraordinary place. And to see these caracaras in this setting and have them sort of massed around us and flying over my head and, you know, complaining when I got too near their nests, it was, it, you know, I was never going to forget it. It changed me forever. For those of us who live inland, pelagic birds are like a dream. What are they like to encounter in real life? Oh, it's extraordinary. I mean, the um, one island that I mention a lot in the book is a place called Steeple Jason, which has the largest colony of black-browed albatrosses in the world on it, about 140,000 birds. And if they're all, uh, in the summertime, they're all sitting on their nests, which are about the size of a tire. And you can imagine this sort of, it's uh, albatrosses, the really big albatrosses have a wingspan, royal and, and wandering albatrosses of almost 12 feet. Um, the or, you know, about, about three meters, three to four meters. Yeah. This, uh, I'm just trying to visualize if it's large, longer than a condor, the American condor. Or uh, the, the wingspan is a little bit longer than a condor. They're not quite as heavy. Um, they're, mm. they're more streamlined, uh, but, uh, but still very impressive to see. But the, the birds that, that land, uh, that uh, breed on Steeple Jason, black bread albatrosses are a bit smaller. They're about, um, you know, about two meters, but still quite impressive. You imagine a seagull sort of blown up to uh, <laughs> several pumps of a bicycle pump, you know, you, you, you start getting there. And to see this many of them all sitting there, all breeding, sitting on eggs and chicks, um, it, it's quite mind boggling. I mean, it's it has almost an urban feeling to it. It's like you've walked into a city, but it's a city of birds. 
And is it noisy? Are they all calling at the Oh, time? very much so, yes. Yeah, the, there's all these... <laughs> kind of sounds that they make. And uh, rockhopper penguins are, are in there among them, which are these little foot-high penguins with yellow crests sticking out of their heads and these sort of angry-looking red eyes, like as if they've... They haven't had their coffee yet, and they're just really they're really waiting for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's just uh, they're and all of them just so animated with uh, with personality and life energy and um, the sense that they're doing the things they want to do just as much as you want to do the things yeah. you want to do. Can you talk about the differences between the Caracaras and the Peregrine Falcons, both of which belong to the falcon family? And then you make this point about specialist versus generalist birds. And other guests in the show have also talked about that. Sure. The, the, the origins of the falcon family to which the Caracaras belong, uh, I think, and I make a case for this in the book, lie in Antarctica, which was warm for a very long time. Uh, we, the icy continent we think of now it has been, that's not the majority of, the, of Antarctica's existence as a, as a separate continent. Um, when the Cretaceous extinctions occurred, when the, uh, that big uh, meteor hit the, about the Yucatan Peninsula about 66 million years ago and killed off most of the big dinosaurs, uh, along with a lot, of the other, a lot of other life on Earth, uh, Antarctica was warm. It was covered in forest. Uh, it was maybe a little bit like what New Zealand is like now in its climate and uh, and forest cover. And uh, it was full of animals. And I think that the ancestors of, uh, of falcons probably lived there, survived the Cretaceous extinctions there, and then came north into South America later on. And uh, they diversified first in South America, and that's still where we find the greatest diversity of falcon species today. Um, Caracaras, the strange group of birds called forest falcons, that which we know almost nothing about. A new species was described in 2003 uh, that lives in the, in the Amazon basin in the Guyana Shield. And uh, then, uh, let's see, what else? The laughing falcon, which is a, a little sort of uh, snake-eating specialist that looks like it's always just woken up from a nap. It has this crest of sort of pale feathers on top of its head. And then one lineage uh, sort of escapes South America, moves into the northern world, and spreads around the rest of the globe in the last 20 million years or so. And these are the birds that we call true falcons, uh, even though they're not the most ancestral in their lineage. Uh, and they're the ones that are familiar to us, peregrines and kestrels, merlins, hobbies, uh, sacred falcons, hammer falcons, all the falcons that um, we think of from falconry. and But this group is actually quite specialized. They're peerless hunters, uh, especially on the wing of, uh, of other birds and small mammals. And this is not really what the caracaras are like. Uh, the caracaras are much more like us in some ways. They make the best of what's around them. They'll eat almost anything from the, the Darwin commented about a species in South America called a chimango caracara that he said it is truly omnivorous and will eat even bread. And uh, although caracaras will hunt live prey, um, that's not all they do. Uh, and their, their lives seem to be more preoccupied with social concerns uh, than the than the true falcons. And I guess the point you're leading me towards about generalist versus specialist is in the book, um, there's an encounter between a striated caracara in the Falklands and a peregrine falcon, because there are peregrine falcons also in the Falklands who have come back from the northern world and reoccupied South America. Uh, and basically in that in that encounter, um, you sort of see the the conflict between these two ways of approaching life. One is to be very good at one thing. Um, another is to be kind of good at a lot of things and very flexible. And both approaches can work. Um, but the one that's more like the way we are is, I think, is the caracaras. And that's part of what drew me to them. There was a strange, almost humanness about them, a kind of a consciousness that I'd never seen from another animal. And to see that in an animal with whom, you know, we know the last time we had a common ancestor was 300 million years ago uh, is really arresting. Jennifer Ackerman, who wrote this book called The Genius of Birds, was a guest on the show, and she made this point about avian intelligence and linked it to adaptability. 
Now, your book gave me pause because you say these caracaras are highly social and adaptable, but they're still endangered. Well, the, the one, there's only one species that's really rare, and that's the striated caracaras. The other nine species, uh, which live throughout mainland South America, are not threatened at, at the moment, although some of the ones that live in the tropics are, are sort of threatened by default because as tropical forests disappear, their habitat shrinks. But the one the question for the book is is a question that even Darwin had because he thought why were striated caracaras only in the Falklands of all places and some islands off of Tierra del Fuego like Cape Horn Island itself uh, because it doesn't seem obvious when you meet them you think well this bird should be everywhere but it, the problem for them I think is uh, is largely a problem of geography it's not a problem of intelligence if you sailed east from Tierra del Fuego. Um, the next land you would hit would be Tierra del Fuego. It's, the world is just mostly water in the southern latitudes. <laughs> and so they've, they've, the Striated Caracaras have arrived after a long journey, which I, I chronicle in the book through, through time of all the, the different Caracara species sort of branching out throughout all the habitats of South America. I mean, everywhere you go in South America, there's at least one species of Caracara, sometimes three or four. But, uh, the striateds, for uh, for reasons that the book explains and trying to answer Darwin's question, uh, have ended up at this far end of the continent, really closer to Antarctica, where I think their ancestors came from, than any other falconid species. They're even on an island called Diego Ramirez, which is um, the southernmost point of the continental plate of South America that comes above the ocean. It's south even of Cape Horn, just a little speck of land, and they're there too. So 500 miles from Antarctica, right at that point. But they, uh, I, I think it's going to be very difficult for them to get out of this situation, geographically speaking. Like ravens in the northern world um, have the entire northern hemisphere almost to deal with. And they have, you know, the boreal forests of Siberia. They have like, they have a, just this massive uh, habitat that, uh, or potential habitat available to them. And striated caracaras don't it may be that um brains enough are, are not brains alone are not enough yeah. to save them so going up is not an option for them i think it would be difficult and, and partly because uh the the south polar vortex uh, which is this almost unceasing uh westerly wind that's always blowing down there because of the rotation of the earth itself um, means that any birds that you know got out of sight of the Falklands are going to be probably blown north and west, which is just into the open waters of the Atlantic. Um, they've never made it to South Georgia, the island of South Georgia, which is about only 750 miles away, but it's to the south. Uh, and it's I think the prevailing winds just would tend not to blow them that way. And it may even be that as the uh, you know as the world warms, the seas are going to rise, all all islands will shrink. Um, the, the their seabird prey because they prey on the the chicks and eggs of these seabirds in the summertime especially uh, could potentially migrate to the Antarctic Peninsula and start you know they might move around uh, in a way that the caracaras cannot do they can't follow the seabirds out to sea they can't swim they can't drink salt water like seabirds can uh, so they're really kind of stuck and I don't know what their uh, fate will be. Mm -hmm. The striatids yeah. we're talking about. The other caracaras in South America, I'm actually I'm pretty optimistic about most of them. They're, they're so adaptable and clever and, and uh, um, good at finding partners in their search for food that I, I suspect they may be able to handle whatever we can throw at them. Your book has Hudson and Darwin as two personalities that loom large over the book. Uh, people know Darwin, but can you talk a little bit about Hudson? Yes, I mean, the, the one of the... the Darwin, as I mentioned, when he he uh, met striated caracaras and when he was on this voyage aboard the Beagle, he was a kid. And it, it's hard to remember that because you think of him as this white bearded ancient with a like looking into the distance, looking haunted. But that's not who he was at that time. He was 21, 22 years old. He was full of enthusiasm. He was uh, uh, sometimes uh, very wrong about things. And uh, I came away from thinking about him both with uh, 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 you know, with, with amusement about how wrong he was about some things, like uh, like the function of music, for instance. Um, I completely disagree with him about that, as did Mr. Hudson, we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but 
but also how extraordinary it was that Darwin was able to make the leaps of imagination and logic that he did, given how much information was not available to him at that time. Darwin didn't know that the continents could move. Darwin didn't know how old the earth was. Darwin uh, didn't know about DNA. All these, all these things that now seem pretty obvious to us or, or, or have been through repetition become so famous that it seems almost as if we've always known them. These were not available to him, and yet he was still able um, to make these incredible leaps of, of, as I said, logic and, and imagination. Now, Hudson, so, go ahead. To your point about music, uh, Jonathan, why did we invent it? Yes, I mean, the, the part what, what William Henry Hudson uh, would probably say to that is that we didn't invent it, um, that, the, uh, that music is common throughout the animal world. Um, the making sounds with our bodies, both for, for purely for pleasure, purely for expression, and then also for some what you think of as evolutionary purposes as, um, you know, like attracting mates and this kind of thing. But there's, but uh, Hudson was born in, uh, to immigrant parents in Argentina in the 1840s. And he grew up on a sheep farm south of Buenos Aires uh, in this broad grassy plain called the Pampas. It's an absolutely flat stretch of land that has that's covered in these in this, these tufts of grassland, and uh, he grew up absolutely enraptured with the wildlife of this place, which was uh, a lot of it was uh, was water birds actually because it was so sort of stopover during the spring rainy season for migrating shorebirds, um, birds going both directions within South America. There were birds that were heading south. There were birds that were heading north, but he. Uh, didn't really meet, have, know anyone else growing up who was as interested in wildlife as he was. And he got the idea that if he went to England, he would find people who were because he'd read, uh, his, his brother brought him a, a copy of this revolutionary book called The Origin of Species. And also he read Gilbert White's um, Natural History of Selborne Parish. So he went to England and was very surprised and kind of disappointed to find that it was not full of Darwin's and, and, and Gilbert White's at all. Um, ornithologists kind of snubbed him and uh, in his description of, of Chimango Caracaras, which I mentioned earlier, which were common at his family's farm when he was growing up, he said, a bird so cosmopolitan in its habits would have had a whole volume to itself in England. Being only a poor foreigner, it has had no more than a few unfriendly paragraphs bestowed upon it. And you can tell that, or I, I feel like he's talking not just about the bird there. Yeah, he was the first, I think the first European writer, certainly, to to talk about caracaras in any kind of sympathetic way. Even Darwin had called them false eagles who ill become so high a rank, he said. So uh, Hudson uh, thought that they were ingenious and, and admirable and fascinating. And I loved that about him right away. And then the more that I, I started to look into the, the work that he produced, because he was this very kind of uncategorizable character. He wrote novels. Um, in fact, probably the the thing that he produced that became most famous is a novel called Green Mansions, uh, which is set in the, the forests of Southern Guyana and is a, kind of a strange sort of fairy tale of a novel. But he was admired by Con uh, Joseph Conrad, Virginia Woolf, Ernest Hemingway uh, as a writer. And he, he wrote uh, also about the wildlife and landscapes of his home growing up. He also wrote about English wildlife and landscapes. And that was what eventually gave him an, an audience in the uh, in the UK. I mean, he died, he was quite famous when he died, but it took him a long time to get there. And he wasn't a scientist. Uh, he wasn't exactly a novelist. He was somewhere in between. He called himself a writer and field naturalist. And in a way, I think he has kind of caracara-like qualities in that he's neither fish nor fowl. And I was going to say that could describe you as well, along with musician. <laughs> <laughs> well, in... in in the book, I enjoyed using Hudson as a little bit of an avatar for me because um, I, I didn't really want to appear in the book very much. Um, mm. I, I did, I'm not the subject of the book. At the same time, sometimes mm. you have to use your own perspective a bit to draw the, you know, to, to bring the reader into the story. Uh, like in the third section of the book, which is a, a, a long river journey that takes place in Guyana, the place where Hudson had set his novel, even though he himself had never been there. But I went there with... Uh, three Amerindian men from that region um, named uh, Brian Duncan, Josie George, and uh, Rambo Roberts, and a Canadian scientist named Sean McCann. And we went up a river called the Rewa in far southern Guyana. Uh, 
that's one of the wildest in, into one of the wildest parts of all tropical South America. And that was in part to look for uh, caracaras because there are uh, a couple of tropical caracaras, including one that preys only on wasps' nests, uh, mm. a, a bit like honey buzzards or something, except that they, unlike honey buzzards, they don't have uh, uh, those sort of heavy armored scale-like feathers on their, on their faces. Uh, they actually mm. have bare red throats. And mm. there was uh, speculation that they uh, secrete a natural wasp repellent. And Sean, uh, for his PhD, had tried, studied whether this was actually true or not. I won't give that away now uh, because what he found is extraordinary. But the red-threaded yes. caracaras uh, are such a strange raptor. They're maybe the weirdest raptor on Earth. Um, they live in family groups of uh, between three and 12 or 13 individuals, multiple males, multiple females. Sean had discovered their nest, which no one had ever photographed before. They nest in bromeliads, um, sometimes in, in tall emergent trees, sometimes 200 feet above the, the forest floor. Uh, they seem to raise one chick at a time. That's all that's been seen so far. And they feed it on wasp combs. And they also uh, litter their nest with millipedes, uh, which uh, we don't know this for certain, but Sean suspects that they're using them as a kind of uh, uh, pest control, as like a, a chemical repellent um, to, to keep parasites out of the nest, which would be a use of chemical technology, basically. The, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's they are they behave almost more like a troop of monkeys or something than than a group of birds. They travel around the forest in um, a pretty cohesive group. They perform these elaborate uh, displays of screaming and and uh, sh shaking their wings and doing what almost looks like a kind of dance against anything they consider to be an intruder, including you if you visit them. And uh, they have a really wide vocal repertoire for a bird of prey. They all these clucks and coos and whistles and screams, and they um, it, it sounds almost like a language of some kind. You get the sense that these are very, very complex minds mm -hmm. looking at you mm -hmm. when you're dealing with them. But they're very warlike. They're very sort of bellicose mm -hmm. seeming, uh, unlike the the striated caracaras I met in the Falklands, which just wanted to come up and hang out with you. Um, mm -hmm. These guys just want to let you know that you're not getting away with anything while they're around. Mm. We had Sai Montgomery as a guest at the, in this oh, podcast, yeah. and she's written a book on American condors. Yes. And one of the things both she and you say in your books is, unlike raptors, she said condors are very social and, and uh, curious. And you say the same thing about the uh, caracaras. And I'm thinking both of you are thinking of the falcons who are the... The, the Yeah, quote unquote, true falcons or hawks and yeah. eagles. Now, one of the things about yeah. falcons, though, that's really fascinating, and this has only come out in recent years, is that genetically, um, their nearest relatives aren't hawks and eagles. Um, their closest relatives are parrots. And when, when you think about a parrot, then you, 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 know, you think, oh, okay, that's a very social, very intelligent animal. And you can sort of, I feel like in Caracaras, you can see more of this shared ancestry than you can in the, in the true falcons, which seem to have left it behind to some degree. Correct. Yes. Um, so tell us about um, the Guadalupe Caracara. Um, you talk about the endangered bird. Yeah, that's a, that's a sort of a sad story. It's the only bird of prey ever to have been wiped out by human beings. Uh, it lived on an island called Guadalupe. It's not the one in the Caribbean, but there's another island called Guadalupe that's off of Baja, California, um, which is the, mm. the long peninsula that sticks south of California that's part of Mexico now. Um, that, uh, but off to the, to the west of it, this, there's this volcanic island all by itself called uh, Isla Guadalupe. And there was a caracara that lived there. Uh, people didn't turn up on Guadalupe, so far as we know, sort of like with the Falklands or the Galapagos, until the mid 1800s and uh one of the first things that the first people who went there were uh sealers uh hunting the elephant seals and, and the, the fur seals that lived on its beaches uh, then they were followed by uh, goat farmers and the uh the goats pretty much destroyed the vegetation of the of the island and the goat farmers weren't weren't uh very happy with these caracaras that were everywhere and killed as many of them as they could. And as the birds became rarer, people started to, to seek them out to, to, to get uh, skins of them to sell. Uh, and so they, they suffered the fate of uh, 
many endangered species in that they're, as they became rarer, they became more valuable. As they became more valuable, they became rarer still. Uh, and eventually on December 1st, 1900, a, a bird collector named Rollo Beck turned up on the island uh, and said that 11 of the birds came towards him and that he shot nine of them and shot at the other two, but they got away and no one ever saw them again. Uh, so the, I, I visit the, one of the skins of one of these birds in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. But the time from when they were described, I think that specimen was, um, we're looking at the type specimen, so the one from which it was described to science, it was described in something like 1879, and by um, just a little more than 20 years later, they were extinct. Oh, I was just going to say they're very similar to two, two, uh, two living types of caracaras, northern and southern crested caracaras, which look very similar and are uh, the most widespread of all the caracaras. They range all the way from the bottom of Tierra del Fuego up into uh, the southern United States, uh, which I talk about in the end of the book, because they seem to be moving north. Moving on to flamingos, I didn't know they existed in the Andes till I read your book. Yes, yes, that's so. Uh, that's one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in my life. The 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 Andes uh, mountains in South America are relatively new mountains. Um, over the last ten or twenty million years or so, there's been a lot of uplift there. I mean, they started rising back in the back around the Cretaceous period, but we're, <laughs> mountains are quite old. <laughs> they're sort of in the same league with the, with the, even young mountains are pretty old, but they're sort of in the same league with the Himalayas, like just to, to give mm. you context and almost as mm. tall. Um, and they, uh, and in the, in the high peaks, the high deserts and plateaus of the central Andes, um, there are breeding grounds of flamingos. And they're the same kinds of soda lakes in some ways that you would, you know, where you imagine seeing them in Africa or something like this, but they, um, but they're there they're, and it's, it's freezing cold, uh, at very, very high elevations. And there's, there, there's one species that never leaves that region. There's some that migrate in and out of it. Um, but it seems like the most unlikely place in the world to find them because, I mean, it's a place that people compare to the surface of Mars. It, it's yeah. incredibly dry, incredibly cold. Um, and very little apparent life until you you start looking at the um, the the trickle of water that flows down from the snow capped volcanoes, and that's really the source yeah. of life in that region. I mean, you can see why people would worship them as as gods, um, because yeah. they really you depended quite literally on these snows for your survival. And the places where that water runs down, and in some in some places it just uh, accumulates in these alkaline lakes and just stops. Like the source of the river can be seen from its from its end there, and then there's a few rivers that actually meet the uh, flow out and meet the Pacific in the west. Your last chapter is about the future of caracaras. Any parting thoughts? Well, uh, I tell a sort of a silly story in the book about what we might do with striated caracaras if we want them to continue to live, because I'm in some ways not optimistic about their chances if we do nothing. Um, but the choices are strange choices because. Um, their habitat may simply be vanishing. And like many island species, it's, there's no analog. There's no other place you could put them that's exactly like where they were. And as we think about wildlife conservation going into the future, we may have to think about some ways of doing it that are at odds with the model that we've used up to now of thinking of like sort of preserves and wilderness areas where the animals can live freely. Um, we might need more of the animals living in with us in the world as we've remade it. And so I, I suggest that, you know, maybe striated caracaras could be good birds to live in cities. Now that's, I'm being a little bit silly uh, about that, but on the other hand, uh, there are some funny examples. There was a, a striated caracara named Louis that escaped the London Zoo a couple of years ago and spent two weeks on the lamb in North London. He was seen walking down a high street in Kilburn and someone said, saw him quote, ripping into a whole cooked chicken and when he, uh, uh, when the zoo recaptured him, they said that he was none the worse for wear. He'd spent two weeks in the city and been fine. I, I am optimistic about the potential of our imagination to solve what seem like impossible problems. Uh, and so I, I don't want to, I didn't want to write a tragic story because I don't think we know how the story ends. Um, so I, I, I definitely have hope for, for us and for the other creatures of the world. And not least in the fact that um, if I could, if this little was known about a book of, about a group of big, flashy birds of prey, I mean, they're not hard to see. They, they're very conspicuous. My goodness, what do we not know about the less conspicuous parts of the world? 
Uh, the world is nowhere near as known as I thought that it was when I was a child. I thought scientists knew everything. And I came away from this book after 25 years of working on it, um, feeling very humbled and feeling that um, there's a great deal left to learn. As one of the characters says in the a paleontologist named Julia Clark says in the end of the book, says that I think the idea that the world is known uh, prevents people from committing to a life of discovery. And on that note, thank you, Jonathan, for being part of the BIRD podcast. Thank you, Shobha. It's been a pleasure.